in our today's session uh, today's session of the international physiotherapy conference in this session we have a great elite international speaker with us dr sapnila jacob mem she is joining us long away from the malaysia itself dr sapnila mem is a great researcher well known academician and a well known women health physical therapist she is having numerous awards and achievement by their name and she has specialized in the women health physical therapy dr sapnila mem is working as a lecturer in tunku abdul rahman university malaysia and she is working as a uh, academician since last more than 12 years she has done their specialization in the women health from india itself and now serving the malaysia since uh, around more than 10 years and she has received numerous awards and achievement and published there are lots of um, international publication in the international journals so we are really grateful and honored to have sapnila mem with us on the board and it is a matter of real pleasure for us that in spite of having very busy schedule and having even a time difference mem has agreed to our request to share their expertise on the topic the recent advances in the obstetric and gynecological physiotherapy so we are really thankful to you ma'am and a warm welcome to you and it is to inform that we have the participant from around four countries for your session and warm welcome to all the respected senior faculty members and academician who joins us for this international physiotherapy conference welcome to you all kindly mention that we will share the feedback form in the chat box that you should fill anyone can fill it only once and one who will fill the feedback form will get the certificates sooner in few couple of days so enjoy the learning again welcome to you ma'am heart is welcome to you over to you ma'am right okay thank you dr himanshu for the humble introduction uh, am i audible yes ma'am you are clearly audible all right okay uh, so good afternoon everyone welcome to the physio intercates conclave organized in conjunction with the world physiotherapy day and uh, it has been an interesting and informative session going on so far and i'm really honored to share today's session with uh, dignitaries like dr vishwagupta and uh, other my fellow speakers and uh, i would also like to thank uh, dr harsh rashdeep and dr himanshu for giving me an opportunity to become a part of this esteemed event and as a matter of fact actually uh, uh, dr harsh and myself we are batchmates and college buddies as well so thank you dr harsh all right so uh, without further ado uh, i would like to uh, begin with my topic uh, my topic for today is the recent advances in obstetrics and gynecology physiotherapy so before i start just have to tell about uh, myself a bit i'm working as a lecturer academician here in the university tunku abdul rahman malaysia here and uh, mostly my uh, field of practice is a uh, theory only i'm usually uh, involved in uh, teaching the bachelor students the undergraduate students the diploma students about physiotherapy and uh, also we are involved highly involved in the research activity especially women's health research uh, we are quite extensively involved and every year we do some uh, researches and um, and that increases our uh, scope of our practice here also uh, for me for example i go for clinical postings uh, to the various hospitals and centers with the students and then we are uh, we get in touch with the patients especially the women's health department here and i can say that uh, uh, mejia is uh, quite quite forward in the women's health physiotherapy practice and uh, they have all kind of exercise therapy electrotherapy all kind of modalities available that helps us to you know, uh, do our research and you know, teach the students so uh, i'm going to start with my presentation so before i start also uh, as we all know that uh, what is obg physiotherapy so obstetrics and gynecology obstetrics is a branch of medicine that deals with the care of the pregnant woman the unborn child and also the labor and delivery 
Gynecology is the branch of medicine that deals with all kinds of issues, ailments and problems related to the reproductive health of a woman. All right. So the women's cell physiotherapy have found it from the clinical area of obstetrics and gynecology physiotherapy. All right. Sorry. It addresses all the health concerns of women. Uh, excuse me, guys. Sorry. One minute. It addresses all health concern of women like menstrual health, urinary incontinence, uterine prolapse, low back pain, osteoporosis, lymphedema. We starting from the adolescence until the menopause is the women's health physiotherapy that can help a woman to cope up with all these changes. But um, unfortunately, me, uh, the scope of... Uh, can you please be a bit louder? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Sorry for the interruption. Okay, okay. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the field of OBG is uh, still a baby and is still uh, growing and a lot of study, a lot of research and a lot of awareness actually is needed in the OBG physiotherapy. Right? Uh, people are not aware that the help is available. Females, they suffer from all kinds of aches, pain, problems, and they think that, yeah, this is the part of their life and they have to live with it. For example, menstrual pain or there's a pain after the episiotomy after delivery they get so they think that okay this is a part of my life and i have to live and suffer with it in silence but our main aim as obg physiotherapist now is to spread the awareness of uh, that help is available and they should not suffer in silence so in my talk i will be basically uh, focusing on the latest treatment available or any kind of latest approach uh, that is used for uh, in obg physiotherapy we all are mostly familiar with our traditional treatment of kegels exercises biofeedback and all kind of stabilization exercises and all okay but we will discuss some of the newest and the latest trends that has been going on in the field of obg physiotherapy for example you can see that the recent scope of practice is now increased to include issues of pelvic health and treatment of sexual dysfunction in females in relation to problems like vaginismus, vulvodynia, and dyspareunia. Now, these are few terms that are not a very uh, commonly discussed, and the females usually won't be like, for example, in our Asia Pacific uh, countries, usually females are not very uh, you know, uh, comfortable to share these kinds of problems and they are afraid to talk about it. But yes, it's, it's, 2000, it's 2020 actually. So, all the things and all the necessary exercises equipments and most importantly the pelvic physiotherapist is available to sort out all these problems okay so for me i will always say that live smart and help is available that is the main thing problems females pains and all definitely will be there but we need to learn how to cope up with it okay so in this context, uh, the first uh, recent advance that is uh, used or commonly uh, we are following today, and that is called as the biopsychosocial model of health. All right. This is a model and it has, you can see here, it has got three factors. One is biological and it is social and psychological. It is a holistic approach to a patient care. That means especially related to females, any kind of pel pelvic pain, any kind of menstrual pain, any kind of pains and eggs, when we deal, the least recent trend or this DPS model, it advocates that do not look only at the problem, do not look at the biological problem, all right? Because normally the patients, they will just go to the doctor if they have pelvic pain, they have any kind of uh, menstrual abnormality, incontinence, they will go to the doctor, doctor will do their job, they will be prescribing the medications and they will try to uh, treat the pathology of the condition but according to this model bps model it says that it locates that apart from the biological we must take into look into the social as well as the psychological aspect of the patient or ex uh, for example you can see here biological means the physical health disability drug effects Social means, uh, factors means patient have a family, friends, uh, how, how regular he goes out, have peer groups or not, have how the social life is, is an isolated person, okay, is, is not a very cooperative person. Psychological means, okay, and self-esteem, his anxiety, depression, we're talking about mental health and all that, all that 
forms the main part of the rehab of this biopsychosocial model of health right so for example if we talk about a condition menopause a patient is referred to us for osteoporosis or fibromyalgia so according to this model if we use in our history taking if we use this model in uh, planning the treatment for this patient then we will be able to see okay she's a 55 year old woman and she is uh, undergoing menopause so okay it's a part the biological means a part of the biological changes okay we all know about it she has got all these hot flushes and all kind of uh, symptoms associated with menopause. But what about the psychological and the social factors? Psychological factors means maybe she's suffering from emptiness syndromes. Uh, children are out for working. There's a very, very common you know, uh, stage the female face at this midlife. And uh, she may be uh, towards retirement and she thinks that she now she, uh, she's going to have menopause, the feeling of getting older, right? Uh, she's signing the wrinkles, gray hair, all that will be affecting her psychology. And she has the fear that is the most important thing. On top of that, she don't have any friends and she don't have anybody to talk to, not in a very comfortable relation with the husband. So all these things makes it difficult to cope up with the changes of menopause this female they have more chances of suffering from osteoporosis and they have difficulty to go through this phase in their life and when these patients are referred to us for osteoporosis so please whenever you have any patient of fibromyalgia you have any patient of menopause apart from the normal history taking we have to include the questions in our history in our patient interview that includes the psychological as well as the details about their social factor, their family circumstances, their earning or not, or going towards retirement or not, how's the family support and all that. All right. So all these things will help us to use this BPS model. It's a holistic approach to the patient care, right? And also, uh, it will help us to plan the better short-term goals and long-term goals individualized for this patient. Uh, we always plan in our assessment, whenever we assess a patient, we always plan the home education, we provide the uh, uh, home advisors and the patient education program. So for the lifestyle modification and all that. So when we have the record of the social factors, we can help to better to, you know, uh, we can advise them because all this is going to affect their mental health and mental health is the latest, hottest topic that is going on all over the world. And especially again, because of this uh, uh, pandemic and because of uh, you know, lockdowns and all that, people's mental health are affected. Females, uh, they have uh, lack of exercises now because they are less going outside. So recent studies have also shown that the bone pains, aches and even osteoporosis chances, okay, or later, maybe by, by next year, the the cases of osteoporosis may be on a rise, especially in young, uh, young females also. It's just because of the lack of... Uh, so in this case, I mean to say, always whenever we have a patient, the BPS model suggests, it advocates that take a holistic approach to the treatment. It is one of the latest approach that has been used in our practice. And physiotherapists are encouraged to use this model while taking the history with their patients. All right, so whether it's a case of pelvic pain, whether it's a pain of any sexual dysfunction, uh, BPS model is advocated, right? And you can see here the most important, uh, commonly used uh, is in the chronic pain syndromes because pain is multifactorial. It's just not related to the site from where it is coming. It may have origin in the mind. It may have origin in the, you know, in the feelings. So we have to, you know, uh, I have to calculate all the things and history taking is very important. So that's why evidence-based patient-centered interview methods. So now we were, last time we used to talk about the history taking of the patient, one-to-one -one history taking, but now it should be evidence-based patient-centered interviews are encouraged, right? That will be unique to each patient. And most importantly, it will help us to plan the goals and treatment strategies for the patient. So whether, uh, any of the condition is any women's health condition because we are talking about uh, women's health because we are dealing with more pains and aches and females are like always in, you know in they are suffering so in that case this psychosomatic or the psychosocial approach will be very very helpful to us so this is a recent concept that has been going on rounds okay 
The next thing on what we will see today is the pelvic floor dysfunction. We will see some of the latest treatment techniques and some of the latest exercises that we are latest which are going on now for the pelvic floor dysfunction. Please remember pelvic floor dysfunction and females they go hand in hand. In a lifetime, women at least once suffer from pelvic floor dysfunction. This dysfunction may be in the adolescent age, it may be due, uh, maybe in the middle life or it may be in the in, in the old age but at least one study says that at least once the female will suffer sometimes they will seek medical help sometimes they won't so 50 percent of women over age of 40 are affected by the pelvic floor dysfunction and out of 50 percent only 15 percent seek medical help that too when the pain is unbearable maybe if if, if, the, if the bleeding is uh, like uh, manifesting uh, is a menorrhagia then in that case only when they are able to see oh really something is there then i will be going to take the medical treatment otherwise they just keep quiet and learn to live with that pain right and also we can see that and the incidence of pelvic floor dysfunction is rising globally expected to increase 35 percent by 2030 right and we all know that uh, pelvic floor problems in females any age has got so many negative effects on the quality of life okay again we go back to the psychosocial factors because it's all pain so pain aches what will happen that it's going to have a negative effect on their lifestyle, their personal relationship, social life, and their, most importantly, their own mental well-being. So depression, social isolation, they don't want to go out. Uh, they just want to you know, uh, just lie, isolate, right? Just want to take a hot, hot water bag and just lie, right? And even some females may develop anxiety. All right. And overall, what is happening? The pelvic floor dysfunction. All right. Whether it is a pelvic pain, whether it is incontinence, whether it is uterine prolapse, any type of pelvic dysfunction, they are associated with a decreased quality of life. In all our obstetrics and gynecology assessments, or when, when, when we're treating the patient, one of the important goal is to improve the quality of life, especially in women. So this quality of life and we see that it is reduced uh, there are so many scales and outcome measures are available you can always uh, use that while you're doing your assessments and you can find what's the quality of life in incontinence uh, we have uh, done a research last year uh, on the prevalence of incontinence here in the local population and uh, what is the impact on the quality of life and we were like shocked to see the result females there were many females they were had really a poor quality of life. They were they were like uh, uh, not able to participate in daily activities, and they were just stuck to the bathrooms. Right, so many things uh, we found. So I mean to say that uh, all these things are uh, should be addressed. So quality of life should always be addressed in any kind of assessment. Right. Just give me a moment, please. So again, pelvic floor dysfunctions, the females, they will be embarrassed to talk about their condition. They tend to suffer in silence. And most of all, they are unaware of the treatment options available. Okay, these are the common manifestations of pelvic floor disorders in females, a pain or numbness during intercourse, pain in the pelvic region, genital rectum, prolapse, incontinence, and feeling to pass bowel, again and again even constipation constipation again is now has become a psychosomatic disease it is coming under psychosomatic disease and females knowing unknowingly they are suffering from constipation uh, we have many cases here uh, they are just referred for physiotherapy only for the problem of constipation right uh, again lifestyle stress we have found that both of them are uh, very very leading factors of constipation right or uh, accidentally passing pain and pain in the lower back and apart from that any pain uh, in the pelvic floor when we see pain is uh, the, the characteristic of pain is a very very dull aching pain pain will be there all the time right these females when you see they will always be complaining of pain there's no specific time where the pain will be increased or decreased pain will be is going to be there all the time they complain of abdominal bloating and also they have deep tenderness present. So when they go for a checkup, the physiotherapist do the examination, the basic examination when we perform and we perform to the tenderness, you can see the tenderness is present, tightness, especially in the pelvis area will be present. This is a 
that is a typical feature of any kind of pelvic floor disorders. Later, you can even uh, go find some trigger points externally also. Later, we do the TV examination, then definitely we can find some of the um, trigger points. But externally also, there will be deep-seated tenderness that will, is going to be present. So it's just going to be a dull nagging pain and uh, it's just going to affect their um, uh, quality of life. They are not feeling well always. No, they are socially, they are impaired. So all these things are going on in the female's mind. So one of the pelvic floor disorder nowadays, what we're going to discuss today, that is the female sexual dysfunction. Latest we, uh, we know that we are treating incontinence. We have been treating all this low back pain and prolapse from a long time. But the latest, uh, the recent uh, branch of OBT uh, that deals uh, with the female sexual dysfunction and the pelvic physiotherapists, we call them as pelvic PTs. They are specialized in taking care of the pelvis of the females, all right, from adolescent pelvis until the old age. So can see that the growing area of ABG speciality now encompasses a range of conditions related to the pelvic floor that affect the bladder, bubble, and the vagina. And out of all of them, uh, vaginismus, vulvodynia, right? Uh, they are the most commonly treated problems, most commonly referred for any kind of physiotherapy because most of them cause dyspareunia, that is the painful sexual intercourse. So females, they don't know that the help is available and they can do something about it or not, right? So, uh, this, but yes, help is available and we'll be discussing what other treatment strategies that we can be used for these patients, all right? So both these conditions, vaginismus, vulvodynia, are treated by the physiotherapists, all right, because there are no medicine as such, painkillers, apart from painkillers, nothing much can be done, right? And uh, physiotherapy may definitely help and improve their function and maximize their quality of most of the research is you know, based on improving the quality of life. Because they eat the painkillers, they go for the myofacial release, the pain will be okay. But it may come again if they don't, uh, we don't consider the psychosocial aspect or the other aspects of the, you uh, know, uh, in our treatment. So uh, maximizing quality of life is very important. You can see most of the studies support the quality of life. Okay, these are the pelvic floor muscles. Okay. All right. So the most common out of all of them, vaginismus, vulvodynia, the most common condition that is uh, referred for physiotherapy nowadays is the it's called as vaginismus, is the fear, the feeling of pain involving any form of vaginal penetration. It means the female is uh, has a fear for the penetration. And uh, involuntary muscle spasm related to the pelvic floor muscle, mostly the deep muscle that is the pubococcygeus muscle. The muscle is very tight, have spasms, and it is mainly responsible for the female that not allow the penetration. So it, when you see that, it's difficult. Vaginismus females, they have difficulty in inserting tampons, even sexual intercourse. They want to go for a cervical swab or a pap smear that all is uh, affected. They are not able to take part in all these procedures. All right. So according to the American College of OBG, that is obstetrics and gynecologists, it involves the tightening of the muscle in the outer third of vagina. But again, as I told, it also has the psychosocial causes associated with it. All right. And again, it may rise, give rise to pain, fear, humiliation, frustration, leading inadequacy, feeling of abandonment. All these things may be going on in her mind. So this is the problem that the female is facing and she ha might have uh, no, uh, uh, not discussed with anyone. Apart from that, there's another condition that is known as a vulvodynia. Vulvodynia, you can see here is the chronic pain in the vulva. You can see the, the female is in lithotomy position, supine lying with hips semi flexed and abducted and she complains of pain on the area outside of the genitals and the pain is usually called as a burning standing or itching or rawness sensation all right there are actually several diagnostic criteria that are given one of the criteria is pain should last should be more than three months all right and uh, there should be no history of any kind of allergy or history of any kind of uh, skin doors just complain of pain in the outer area around the uh, vulva and also there is another condition uh, that is around the vestibule area. She may complain of 
pain in this area. Okay, so again, this condition uh, may be separate or it may coexist along with the vaginismus together. Okay, both of these conditions, vulvodynia and also vaginismus, give rise to um, something called as the dyspareunia. Dyspareunia, that is the call as a uh, defined as the current gerin recurrent gerontal pain with sexual activity. So again, dyspareunia is uh, again a uh, referred case of big physiotherapist. If dyspareunia can be of uh, uh, primary or secondary, uh, primary means uh, she always uh, she has a fear of penetration. Secondary uh, dyspareunia means there has been a pain-free period of uh, lack of penetration and later the pain of fear has developed. Now again, the uh, sexual abuse or any kind of um, Mostly they are usually ruled out if it is a kind of case of secondary uh, dyspareunia. Also after delivery, if episiotum is that postpartum dyspareunia, actually that is also very common. And the female may be referred for physiotherapy to you know, uh, uh, go for some releases or help the female to go back to the postpartum, uh, to uh, get back to the uh, fitness level again. So you can see here the postpartum dyspareunia, maximum referral for treatment, episiotomy and scar all right so uh, while we do our assessments physiotherapy assessments uh, for any case of a vaginismus or any, any case of dyspareunia in our ob external observation we have to always check for any kind of episiotomy or any kind of scar because if uh, sometimes if the scar is elevated of the scar is a twice scar second delivery again episiotomy first delivery again episiotomy so what has happened the scar has become very elevated so it may also give rise to dyspareunia all right. If it is case of primary dysmenor uh, dys, uh, periunia, then it may be it may be a leading cause of infertility. All right. So again, the, uh, during the examination or assessment, these points are all off. Oh, these are very sensitive questions. And again, as I told that, we have to include that in our assessment. So again, the privacy, confidentiality of the patient is very important because apart from the doctor, they will be sharing all these personal details to a pelvic physiotherapist. But yes, we are the pelvic physiotherapists are, you know, advocates and we are specialized to ask all these questions we are specialized to perform all the treatments so you can go ahead and ask them please, please inform all the informed consent and all the basic formalities and then you can go ahead right but another thing about this perunia again as i told you that uh, fear avoidance cycle i will be showing it later yes this cycle you can see here this cycle of pain that is pain, maybe it's a pelvic pain, where it is a pain in the vaginas, pain of vaginismus, or whether it is a vestibular pain, right, will lead to avoidance, avoidance of the sexual activity, avoidance of the penetration, and then leads to further reduced desire, again, leads to further arousal, and again, what will happen because of thinking, because of stress with the partner and all that, what may happen that the muscle spasm may increase more. And this will give rise to more pain. So it's an unending cycle. Okay, physiotherapists, we have to break this cycle to treat our patients. All right. So uh, I'll, I'll later I will discuss what things can be done. So this is called as the pain avoidance cycle. Please remember this cycle whenever you are dealing with any kind of pelvic pain, especially females uh, with uh, chronic pelvic pain, vaginismus, and this. Uh, this Periunia, please take care which cycle are they all the females they will be going through this cycle this also you can always mention in your assessments or when you are doing your patient notes all right and the traditional management of all these the dyspareunia with uh dyspareunia vaginismus you no know, it's all the tender loving care we have the uh, sexual counseling is available listening to the patient what happened so a detailed history one-to-one -one is very important. Education to the patients all are have been a soft scar tissue for episiotomy. We teach them the deep needing. Also, uh, ultrasound has been given a lot. All these are very traditional treatments. Even self-massage can be done, all right? And plus the Kegels exercises. This we have been doing in the past and it has got all got very good results, okay? These are the few outcome measures that are commonly used. Uh, Valvodynia pain score, vast 
NRS, WAS, Lemon Scale for good houses in assessments. All right. Uh, still, uh, there are many assessments that are you know, still under construction, and we need more of the uh, scales you know, for measuring different kinds of pains and different kinds of conditions. Uh, but these are the very commonly used. You can always see them in the patient files. Right, and it will tell you about uh, what is the what is the condition of the patient that will help also help you to plan the short term and the long term goals for the patient. All right, so we advocate again to use more outcome measures in our assessments that will give an upper hand to our assessment. If we have uh, more outcome measures you have used, that means yes, your assessment is quite authentic. So this we have discussed. These are the few traditional treatment that has been done from ages. Uh, relaxation technique, breathing, biofeedback. All right, we have just discussed stress, uh, you know, lifestyle modification program. Doctor will be giving them local anesthetic creams and gels that be applied locally, right? Uh, that can be uh, applied per vaginum or can be applied locally antidepressant if she has like too much of pain so this all can be done biofeedback this definitely all can be used okay the another treatment latest treatment what i'm going to discuss today is uh, something called as the vaginal dilators all right so you can see here these are the dilators uh, they they are latest trend used by the women's health physiotherapist they are uh, available and when you go to a women's health department you have a women's health department then definitely will be like we have the dumbbells we have the barbells all these for the exercises for our voluntary muscles similarly for the exercise of the uh, delicate pelvic floor muscles we have some special devices all right the is especially meant for the females, okay, according to their anatomy, they are meant ergonomically designed to fit in their pelvic floor and they can exercise with these. So one of them is called as the vaginal dilators, right? Uh, they are used per vaginum. It helps to retrain the soft tissue in and around the vagina, okay? So you can see it comes in various uh, shape, sizes actually right and the training is done by the physiotherapist there are so many researches uh, that says that it advocates now the use of dilators okay um, and you can see that it is the pelvic physiotherapist will help to teach the patient about the demonstrate uh, on the sorry uh, how to properly use these dilators, all right, with a water-based lubricant and how to progress the dilators, all right. So the basic session uh, normally will be uh, followed by relaxation. It should be a very quiet room. It should be the female should be have, uh, you know, the, uh, practice some relaxation, some breathing exercises, especially the diaphragmatic breathing exercises, all right. And then she's taught how to use this dilator, insert this dilator per vaginally, and then dilator will be placed for five to 10 minutes there. So it just, as the name suggests, dilates, right? If there is episiotomy there, if it is a lot of tension and spasm in the tissues around, she has never done Kegels exercises, right? And plus the stress, the pain, she has been very busy with their, her work and never been paid attention to the pelvic floor. Now the age is catching up. So all this condition, the, she, she's having this tight, uh, on, a lot of uh, no, tightness in the pelvic floor muscles. So in that case, the dilators will help to dilate the tissues around. All right. So it can be just be placed to five to 10 minutes there, depending upon starts with five to 10 minutes, then it can be uh, progressed to around 20 minutes in a session so far. All right. And it has got a various, uh, actually thickness is variation. You can see the thickness is very start with the smallest one, the thinnest one, and then go with the uh, thickest one. So it will help to dilate the area at the same time, the she can also practice the Kegels exercises if needed. Okay, so uh, most importantly, it just has to be there in the place. She can do her work, she can go around, she can climb the stairs with the dilators in place. Okay, important thing about use of dilators that I have to use uh, every day actually when she's having a therapy session because let the tissues get relaxed there for a while, then uh, once it is uh, no, that it comes on a set of five or four. So, and she has reached the maximum thickest one. After that, she can continue with the Kegels exercises. Okay, so that the Kegels exercises will make, make her to lengthen the muscles, will help to maintain them, improve the tones of the pelvic floor muscles and all that. 
so this uh, dilators are the new, uh, very very uh, like uh, hotter selling can say and you can give them teach them and teach them and tell them to use as a part of their home exercise program all right so therapists can just tell them one time it's all all available in amazon all available online all right and they can but yes research it is a research proven there are many researches that support the use of dilators now okay there are different brands depending upon you know, the country to country that can be chosen and patient can use on there okay apart from that uh, another exercises uh, these are called as the pelvic floor activation exercises we have been using diaphragmatic breathing exercise we have using the uh, deep uh, core stabilization exercises Okay, all these kind of exercises, but the evidence regarding the pelvic floor exercises is uh, like uh, I have so many in the past few years. It is uh, one step higher than the Kegel exercises. Uh, just uh, for example, Kegel exercises, we always been hearing that Kegel exercises means you have to hold, you have to sit on a chair or maybe high flying, right, on a, on a, uh, on a uh, couch and then you have to hold relax that means you have to feel that uh, you are uh, you are trying to contract your pelvic floor we explain in our patient words that imagine you are in a uh, no in a market and you want to go to washroom and there's no washroom around so what do you do you try to hold the e right so we try to hold the valve contract as soon as you get the pelvic floor relax the uh, muscles so similarly we just tell the patients we have been telling our patients to contract relax contract relax or we have been explaining them to hold count one two three and then relax right but in the pelvic floor activation exercise uh, one of the advantages that what we can do is we can incorporate breathing along with our kegels uh, kegels exercises so last time there was very limited evidence but now a lot of evidence is there so what the patient can do normally when we take in air when we take in air what happens the diaphragm goes down our pelvic organs they are all suppressed down correct and imagine in same condition in the same state if we tighten our uh, pelvic floor muscle what will happen the pressure in the pelvis is going to increase the abdominal pressure is going to increase so what we have to do, we have to activate the right muscle that's the key to the best kegel exercise so what we have to do in this exercise is that we usually we we advocate or we teach the patient that means you breathe out and then you perform the kegels exercise that means you contract the pelvic floor on the out breath so when we breath out at the same time breath is going out at the same time the pelvic floor is contracted all right so this Patient, people have to the patient has the therapist has to teach this to the patient in a way we will be isolating more we will be activating our pelvis practice all along ask the patient to exhale deep exhale and at the same time contract the pelvic floor this will also activate the pelvic floor another thing that will activate the pelvic floor is the diaphragmatic breathing exercise we advocate more so instead of when we breathe in air our chest goes outside so instead of chest going outside patient can be in supine lying all right she can keep the hands on the tummy and ask the patient when she inhales the tummy should go out what we advocate for our any diaphragmatic breathing exercise all right that will also again the same thing exhale and when she's the, uh, doing the diaphragmatic breathing, when she's exhaling out through the mouth, at the same time, she needs to contract her pelvic floor. So this is a very important tip that is usually missed out. There are so many techniques. I'm just going to discuss a few because it's mostly practicals. I'm just uh, going to just share a few things only. And another thing to activate the pelvic floor. And later in the supine position, while you're doing your diaphragmatic exercises, you can go for all your active movements. You can go SLR. You can be in side lying. You can do SLR side lying. At the same time, you are doing your um, uh, exhalation followed by the uh, contracting of the pelvic floor apart from that um, another thing that is usually missed out and we have to teach our patient that is the pelvic lifts pelvic, pelvic lift means uh, we tell our patients uh, to contract relax squeeze relax squeeze relax instead of adding we have to add one more factor that means hold and then lift She's sitting on a chair, all right? You can do it me, right with me right now, okay? Sitting on the chair, hold, 
contract the pelvic floor at the same time go in we do the push up plus right push up is done and after that we do the push up plus we go some more front similarly contract the pelvic floor at the same time more like we do the elevator exercises what we call it no in our uh, in our physio language we call it so elevator like me imagine you are going in elevator bit more more recruit the, the deeper muscles of the pelvis right group, group exercises pelvic floor exercises one to one and also in the group okay so that is uh, important that can be incorporated in the for the pelvic activation right so you can see uh, studies have suggested that they have pelvic tilting okay pelvic tilting also diaphragmatic will only rise to pelvic tilting and that will give rise to a greater strength of the more of motor fibers of the pelvic floor muscles will be recruited so please use this in your uh, when you are doing teaching exercises to the patient uh, another one more exercises are uh, very uh, nowadays are yeah, that is called as the hypopressive exercises all right it also helps helps to activate the pelvic floor muscles aim to stimulate the abdominal muscles as well as the pelvic floor muscles hypopressive means decrease pressure so we again focus on exhalation hypopressive so for example one of the way in which you can teach this to the patients is um, you can ask the patient to inhale through the nose all right and exhale through the mouth so while they exhale all right they should imagine that the abdomen is shrinking 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 going 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 down as if the umbilicus is meeting the back it's just one of the way to teach the exercises to the patient all right so again it will exercise those muscles which are usually you know not not activated during our normal diaphragmatic breathing also and plus uh, hyperpressive exercises along with the kegel exercise uh, along with this uh, pelvic activating exercises very good uh, you know uh, studies have shown that they have very good uh, uh, improvement in the patient okay patient can do all this kind of upper limb movement sideline prone line and still can do this this exercise hyperpressive guys okay so there are so many exercises available but this is a simple way in which you can explain this to all your patients so again it is uh, many of the researchers many of the pelvic pts they are using these exercises now you can give your patients as a group therapy okay another thing uh, that can be used is the hypotherapy for pelvic floor all right so hypotherapy is usually is the latest advancement in the pelvic floor physiotherapy actually it has uh, been uh, commonly used nowadays for the treatment of uh, cerebral palsy down syndrome and children with cognitive disabilities uh, usually the hypotherapy is used for that but the uh, latest uh, researches latest evidence have proved that hypotherapy is equine therapy that means use of horse just riding a horse right uh, can have so many benefits that can be you know uh, improve the pelvic floor function still the research is limited but yes there are latest researches which are supporting that all right so horseback riding can strengthen the pelvic floor and reduce the risk of the pelvic floor dysfunctions all right so imagine that we we give the exercises um we uh, in our department we'll ask our patient to sit on the gym ball and you can perform the kegels exercises right rotate forward backward sideways rotations so the ball is a moving object at the same time the pelvis is also moving in all the directions correct uh, plus at the same time we ask the patient to go for the kegels exercises correct similarly this is done on the horse is done by the specialized trained practitioners nowadays i can see the physio there are many syllabus based certificate programs and uh, they are running with regular progress reports in in kuala lumpur we have physiotherapy and they are con conducting the certificate they have the uh, you know sessions with with the uh, and have to learn the horse riding at the same time the therapeutic benefits and they have all kind of patients and all kind of children and you know coming for the treatment especially for the postural control especially for the because they they that pelvis the way the gait and the 
pelvis of the horse is quite similar to the movement of the human pelvis in the three-dimensional anterior, posterior, and the lateral disc. So the, all the trick lies in the way the horse moves, the way the rider or the patient sits on the, with the saddle or without a saddle on the horse back, the position of the thigh, the forward bending, the way of holding the saddle, everything this has got relation to do with the patient. Especially for children, actually Down syndrome, cerebral palsy syndrome, they benefit a lot. For, um, uh, you can see here, there are some research done. For example, one study is very interesting. They, the experimental study of fun group, pre-test, post-test study design, 12 women were recruited. And then they were 12 weeks. And uh, they just did the basic horsemanship, controlling the horse, mounting, dismounting, and taking care of the horse. Plus, at the same time, they did the Kegels exercises. All right. The, the vaginal palpation, it, the, uh, the, 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 the post-intervention of the score and the perineometry measures were significantly the improvement in these levels. All right. So it's just the movement of the pelvis in relation with the uh, movement of the horse. Apart from that, uh, you will see that uh, there are uh, artificial horses. Uh, robotics and all are there nowadays, so that will be helpful in uh, you know, uh, artificial horses. If patient cannot go for hypotherapy, uh, I think, I think uh, you can find that they are const under construction robotics, so that the same can be simulated in the department. You can have a horse, robotics and all, and if patient cannot go for hypotherapy, you can do the hypotherapy there in your department. So that is also a latest trend that is usually used. Right? Um, Okay, another thing uh, that is uh, something called as the uh, shock wave therapy. It is also one of the latest trends uh, used in flea. A caustic wave which carries high energy to the painful area. As you can see here, it is widely used for the treatment of musculoskeletal pain like diabetic, uh, like your tendinitis, plantar fasciitis, and all that. Uh, but now, Evidence as support that it is also used, it's called as extracorporeal shock wave therapy or radial shock treatment of uh, chronic pelvic pain. All right, so we can see here. Um, all right, you can see here, for example, three women suffering from CPPAs and they went four weekly sessions of ESWT. This is the uh, pain basal and two follow-up assessments showed that uh, NRS pain scale was used and found to be have significant improvement for right. uh, chronic pelvic pain. The female, the position will be in the, we have uh, actually uh, there are a few demonstration and all that can be attended. All right. Uh, Okay, sorry guys, uh, some, okay, I will just try to cover the things on time. All right, these are the, so chronic uh, shock therapy, therapy. It can also be used for the treatment of the chronic pelvic pain to have dysfunctions, okay? And uh, later we can see that artificial intelligence and female fitness, and that is called digital therapeutics. So nowadays, latest trends, we have the females, they, have, they cannot come because of the engagements and all this. 
they cannot come to work every day, cannot exercise every time, cannot go for physio treatment every day. So they can use their watch, they can use different kinds of apps that are available that will help them to take care of their own cells, especially female fitness. For example, Sensoria that are usually evidence-based, they make the evidence-based digital uh, equipments. So they connect to your shoes, they can tell you about your workout of your you know, running workout and all. We have the Fitbit watch, we have the application that is called Skaya. So all these things are related to the artificial intelligence. And we, when we expect you know, robotics and all to take over few in the coming few years. This is another thing that is called as the pelvic vents. These are also used nowadays again. They are, and especially for the trigger points. If in your examination, in your assessment, you have found any trigger points or painful points in your examination per vagina examination, very difficult to do. It's difficult practically and difficult to do the trigger point massage with the digits. So in that case, pelvic vans are available and that can be inserted per vagina and that can be uh, it has got a, it has got a, you know, the therapist has to teach that to the patient and uh, it can reach the deep muscle the female can do by herself. It can be given as a part of home exercise program and just have to use the tomato check pressure, like how much pressure we use to check the tomato okay or not. Similarly, the band has to be inserted inside, it is ergonomically made and it has to touch the, she has to go around and touch the point. She finds the point, she has to just give the pressure, how much pressure we give to check a tomato. That's all. And then she has to keep on pressing it for three to four minutes or then relax and again press it, then relax. She can do it often or until she finds that it can help again to release the points, uh, the trigger points. It's another thing that is called as the pulsators. These are also very commonly advocated nowadays. All right, these are again, same kind of, uh, that can use for the internal massaging of the tissues, all right? So again, studies have proven that the internal massaging of the tissues may help to prevent the muscle balance, correct the muscle balance, improve the blood flow, right? It will bring more, uh, remove the metabolites from that area. So again, it can be inserted, it is battery operated and the female can use it for the internal massage. Again, it can be taught as a part of home exercise program. All these are evidence-based. So studies are now supporting the use of all these. So uh, the pelvic PT can always teach this to their patients. Sorry, I'm going a bit faster because time is less. Another thing that is called as visceral massage. It is a massage technique that is given. We use both the hands on the patient's abdomen and pelvis. Normally we will use both the palms. We will use the ironing. We use the fingertips to massage the viscera, especially the viscera. Viscera means the liver, spleen, kidney, intestine, the reproductive organs. So there's a, there's a calculative uh, measurement or manipulation of these viscera that is done with the special hands placement so that car formation is all reduced and all the pliability is increased so this can also be used okay uh, still is still under research it's not well researched but still is under research on the rat model they are found to be very effective Okay, some of the intense, interesting fact before I conclude, uh, please remember because I'm an academician. So uh, at this point I have to mention men's health is now included in OBG. So a, a curriculum everywhere, when you see any female's health curriculum, men's health is included. So for us, for example, I'm teaching in university, uh, we are I've just added recently, we have added the men's health also. So a female physiotherapist is entitled, we are here treating patients, our students, they are learning to treat the incontinence patients. They are learning to uh, uh, all the prostatitis uh, rehab, all this, we are learning. We're teaching that to the patient. That is under OBG physiotherapy and may not also suffer from pelvic floor disorders. Also, we have a newest branch that is the female uh, physiotherapist for the female astronauts because osteoporosis is very high in uh, astronauts, chances are very high. So they have to engage themselves in exercises and shockwave therapy is also indicated for erectile dysfunction in males. All right, so maybe uh, that's all. These are my references uh, and that's all. Thank you from my side. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks a lot for such a great wonderful and detailed elaboration on the uh, much needed topic the women's health physical therapy and it is actually uh, needed and 
the physiotherapy is moving ahead and many more uh, physiotherapists are working in the field of women's health and there are lots of milestones to sure. be achieved and uh, there is a long journey so we will definitely uh, try to apply something while learning this and it is actually a great science so thanking you very much heartfelt thanks to you for such a uh, great detailed elaboration and uh, hands on uh, um, thank you experience today so thank you all ma'am and thanks a lot and thank you all the participants uh, i have already shared the feedback form in your chat box you may have filled it anyone can fill it only once and now this is time to go for the next session so you can check your mail id for the next session zoom link id if anybody doesn't receive you can directly whatsapp me on the given number and thanking you all heartfelt thanks to the resource person of the speaker again sapnila ma'am it was really a wonderful session and we have learned a lot thank you ma'am thank you thank you thanks a lot